Welcome to the Armani Talk Show, episode 8. I can't believe that it's already on episode 8. And if you've been enjoying a lot of these Armani Talk shows, uh, be sure to check out for it on the first day of every month. Since it's September 1st today, uh, episode 8 is being released. You could obviously listen to it on YouTube if you want to watch me speak. And you could listen to it on any of the major podcast platforms. Whichever podcast platform that you do listen to it on, be sure to leave your boy a review. Each review helps out tremendously. It's pretty unique that if you tell someone, hey, please leave me a review, a lot of the times they will do it. And a lot of the times they will not do it. See, one of the things that I like about Amazon is that it's very easy for you to get your book up there and begin to sell it on to the masses. But one of the things that I don't like about Amazon is that it's too big. And whenever a place is too big, what I've noticed is that uh, they get cute with it. And one of the ways that Amazon gets cute with KDP, which is called a Kindle Direct Publishing, uh, that's the platform for a lot of the self-published authors, is that they divide the reviews. Every now and then, one of my readers from Australia will be like, Hey, Armani, I just left a review for Level Up Mentality. Good work. I'll go on the listing for Level Up Mentality, and I'm like, I don't see a review from you. And this Australian will screenshot the review, send it to me to prove that he left the review. And that's when I realized something. Oh, I see. Your review registered for uh, Amazon in Australia, but not for the Amazon in the US. How annoying is this? Think about it. Right now, Level Up Mentality should have at least 200 to 300 reviews. But due to Amazon being so gargantuan, uh, the listings are getting uh, divided up and the reviews for the respective country is being put on that respective listing. If all my Australian folks, their reviews registered in the US, I know that I would have way more reviews. So there's the pros and there's the cons. I would definitely say that the pros outweigh the cons though, because in what other generation can you say that a regular guy uh, can start up his YouTube channel, start up a podcast, and begin to write about his or her ideas? Not too many before. Uh, and it's cool because it's uh, publishing uh, on demand. Whenever someone orders, then uh, Amazon will print it out and they will get their copy. I don't need to keep a warehouse. And I know the problems with keeping a warehouse because I've done it before. Prior to me running the KDP business, the self-publishing stuff for Amazon, I used to sell physical products. I used to sell these superhero cell phone cases, these Bluetooth beanies, these tumblers, right? And just a understanding of how this works. I would find a supplier in China. Uh, I would see which one could distribute the product and they would negotiate pretty well on their end. See, do not be fooled. A lot of Americans, when they're thinking about doing business with the Chinese, they initially think, oh, I mean, I will negotiate the hell out of a Chinese man. I mean, he can't even speak English. I am an American. I am smarter than this Chinese man then you will realize that this Chinese man views you as a dumb American. They think they're going to pull a strong arm on you. And that's what, what happened to me in the beginning stages. With the first product that I tried to negotiate from China, I noticed that these guys were highly savvy. They knew their numbers. They knew what you had to sell in order for them to give you a deal. And they had jokes as well. These Chinese men were very charismatic. They knew how to speak English. And by the third product, I finally started to understand how to do business with the Chinese. You needed to be about your word. You can't be one of those guys that's like, I'm going to strong arm them. Because in the East, the number one thing in regards to business is respect. They need to win. And we need to win. 
And the more that they win, the more that they are going to uh, give you a deal. But I noticed something, man. I, I still didn't like it because we needed to uh, fill up the warehouses with our products. So every now and then I'd go to my guy. His name was Andy, the Chinese guy. And I'd say, hey, Andy, um, this month we will be ordering 2,000 units. Instead of charging us six seventy five per unit, can you charge us five fifty? And thus far, we've been working on this deal. He's like, sure. Now, these 2,000 units come to the U.S. and they get registered in a warehouse. If you cannot sell these 2,000 units in a respected um, amount of time, then Amazon, their warehouse is going to keep on charging you. And that's the most annoying thing because here's how your mind operates. Let's say you're selling tumblers and you're dealing with different colors. You have blue, you have silver, black, red, brown. Your logical mind thinks that you will sell equal units of all of these different colors. So you're going to be very tempted to ask your supplier, give me 100 units of brown, 100 units of blue, 100 units of red, and such and such. But in the real world, that is not how it works. In the real world, what happens is that most people want blue. Every now and then, some people want red. No one wants brown. Some people want white. And the numbers are way more skewed than you initially imagined. And let's keep it a buck. You could do all of these different forecasting where in the past, you'll notice that blue sells the most. So whenever you're ordering from your uh, supplier, you say, hey, man, uh, give me more blue. But who is to say that in the future, it's going to keep up with the same trends? It's not always true like that. I, I recall for the most part, when I was running the Amazon business with the tumblers, blue was selling the most. But there came a certain period where certain months, a blue wasn't selling like that. Red was. How am I supposed to know? I don't know. And what happens is that a lot of these units now collect dust in the warehouse. And as it's collecting dust, my line of thinking is, okay, well, do I eat the cost or do I run a discount? Fine, I'll run a discount. So now I'm, instead of making $6 per unit, I'm making a dollar, maybe even 50 cents. And that is the problem with warehouses. It's like you really need to get your forecasting on point. And if your forecasting is not on point, then what's going to happen is that you are going to be running a lot of these discounts. You're going to be paying the warehouse extra money. And it's just a big mess. That's why I really like Amazon. I really like that they will only print the product when a sell has been um, gotten from the other end. So what's my job? My real job is to just create content. Everything else, if you're thinking about it from the bigger picture and you're thinking about it with scale, you will notice that these folks will often sell themselves once they have consumed enough of your ideas. All I'm responsible for nowadays is building the Armani Talks library. And once I have a library, that's where the fun really happens. And now I can begin to convert this library into different languages. Right now, I'm in the process of beginning uh, the Spanish uh, translation. Eventually, it's going to be French, eventually Tamil, eventually Arabic, and much more. But the process of um, converting and translating uh, the material has opened my eyes. I would say, if you ask me in 2018, Armani, uh, do you ever plan to learn Spanish? My first response would be, why the hell would I learn Spanish? I'm in the U.S. And this is a very ignorant thing to say, a very dumb thing to say, by the way, because I live in Florida. A lot of folks in Florida speak Spanish. A lot of these parts, like certain neighborhoods I'll go to, everyone is just speaking Spanish there. It's like a Colombia, uh, a bunch of people from Colombia just came to the U.S. and they set up shop. And it just, for them, in their day-to-day -day experience, it still feels like Colombia, Mexico, Peru, whatever. 
it's high ROI to speak Spanish, especially if you engage with these folks. If you buy their food, if you get a haircut from them, rather than pulling out the translating app, if you could speak Spanish, that's a win. But in 2018, I'm just like, these guys are coming to the U.S. They should be the ones that learn how to speak English. We should not be uh, changing our mind and our language to communicate with them. What gives? But ever since I began to convert the Armani Talks library uh, to Spanish, uh, I've been building a relationship with two folks. One's name is Julie. The other's uh, name is Nico. Julie is the one that gets my English manuscript and she converts it uh, into Spanish. Okay, she gives me the Spanish manuscript. Once I have the Spanish manuscript, that's when Nico comes into the mix. Nico is the person who reads the Spanish out loud. He's my narrator. And ever since I heard Nico reading my Spanish words out loud, I'm thinking, whose words is this man reading? I mean, look at Nico. He has such an amazing uh, rhythmic voice. I want a rhythmic voice like that. Nico, whose words are you reading? That's when I realized he's reading my words. I mean, just imagine I'm over here creating um, one um, one text in English and now it's being converted into Spanish and that begins this entire flywheel effect. And that's when I began to realize whenever I have these technical issues uh, and I have to call someone, They'll say, speak one or click one for English, click two for Spanish. They wouldn't say click two for Spanish if there was no demand. That means there's a bunch of demand. If I could understand Spanish, then I will open up my perspective in a completely different way. I want to learn this language. How am I going to learn this language? I don't quite know. I've been hearing about Rosetta Stone before. And another thing that I've heard is that one underrated way in order to learn a new language is to consume its entertainment. And I, I'm not like a rookie with this because I would consume a lot of Bollywood entertainment growing up. Uh, and I could understand some basic Hindi, but not enough. I believe if I turned off the subtitles and I would force myself to understand the content, then my Hindi game would be a, a lot higher. Uh, but I could I could take those lessons and apply to Spanish. Maybe the one underrated way to learn a new language is to consume Spanish entertainment without the subtitles. You can make the argument that the the subtitles should help you even more, but let's just make it challenging for us. And I would say that's a great way to learn the new language. I, I gotta first try it out before I'm fully certain. As of right now, it's simply a hypothesis. And another way uh, people will often say is that you live in uh, the place that you want to learn the language of. So if you want to learn Argentinian or whatever they speak, you live in Argentina for a year or two. And then from there, you're capable of uh, building a stronger fluency in regards to it. That's a cool thing with having a business, a, a business or a remote job. It doesn't really matter where you live. You could just live wherever the heck you want. One of the cheat codes uh, that often is said online is make USD but live overseas. I wouldn't uh, abide by that because I like the US a lot. Uh, but I could see someone who, let's say, they're fed up with the US. They're like, man, I have no loyalty to this place. I'm leaving. But they're still over here making the USDs. They could live like a king wherever the hell that they move. Because I have heard from a lot of these folks that live in uh, places overseas, you could even say certain third world areas, these guys have maids, these guys have uh, cooks, they have drivers, and they're not making that much USD. It just once you get the USD and you convert it into um, an overseas currency, you're capable of living like a king. That's always been my philosophy in regards to wherever you live. You should do your best to live like royalty. Because if you're going to be living there, that's a big commitment. And I don't think enough people take this seriously. Uh, there was a certain period where I was living up north. And initially, they weasel you in with, by trying to get you to move in during the summer. 
You move in the north during the summer, everything is fine and dandy. The roads are clean. Uh, it's a very expensive area, which means that um, th- there's a, a cost of entry, right? I, I pretty much moved to Virginia for my job, a- as well as Jersey. They're weaseling you in with the great weather. But by the time the uh, winter comes, winter is coming. If you understand Game of Thrones, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And that's when it becomes such a burden. I mean, it's freaking freezing. And I've actually heard that people who live up north, they have um, this thing called SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder, which can lead to depression, hopelessness, uh, you being sad. Just think about it. That's the acronym, and that's the emotional state. Why the hell am I going to want to live somewhere like that for? And don't even get me started on New York and Chicago. I, there was a certain period where a lot of my Chicago coworkers were coming from Chicago to Tampa, okay? Uh, because we both had our teams in those two locations. And whenever the Chicago guys would come to Tampa, they'd be like, wait a minute, you guys have a garage where you could park your cars? It's like, what kind of question is that? Yeah, uh, don't you? They're like, no, we don't have a garage. We have to look for parking every day in one of these little lots. And that's not even guaranteed. I was like, that's not even guaranteed. So what happens? What happens if you can't find one of those lots? Like, oh, we have to park really far away. Then we need to walk to the office. Okay. And what if it's snowing or if it's just cold that day? You just got to suck it up. Bring two jackets, not one. That's their solution to this. Bring two jackets, not one. I'm like, man, I'm not trying to do that shit. You're telling me that I have to park really far away in certain days. I need to walk to the job location where it's freezing. And now I'm supposed to start an eight-hour shift. And then in the back of my mind, I have to know that I have to eventually walk back to my car. No, thank you. That is not living like a king to me. And that's why I've always been more biased towards the South. I'm not just talking on my butt either. I lived up north and it is not only cold, it's more expensive. Just imagine, imagine you come to me and you're like, hey, Armani, look, look, you are going to be living in a place that's really crowded. You're going to be bumping shoulder to shoulder to, with certain people. Uh, certain places are going to be messy. There's going to be like rats uh, going around uh, the streets, uh, a lot of homeless people. And, all right, and, you're going to have to pay more. Pay more? Are you kidding me? Nah, man. I should, if I'm going to be doing that, I could see myself doing that. But I, have to, I should be paying less and I should be making more. Otherwise, to me, it sounds blasphemous to live up north. It's just a waste of time, in my opinion. I mean, we as human beings, we're going to have enough problems. And I've noticed time and time again, what happens is that a lot of folks, they have this romanticized version of where they're going to live. Uh, every now and then, I'll see certain folks are like, my dream is to live in one of the villages in Europe. Uh, someone else will say, I want to live in uh, X, Y, and Z place. I'm hearing it. I'm just like, you want to live there? I can see myself visiting there, but not living there. They're like, well, I want to live there. And that's when I'm starting to wonder. What exactly do you think is going to be happening in these spots? I mean, actually, don't even answer that question. What do you think is going to happen in the place that you live? And this is when it forces them to be somewhat practical with what the hell they're talking about. I think a lot of these folks, they think that every single day in their life is going to be some sort of adventure. While in reality, that's not always the case. In the real world, there's going to be a lot of days where things are just ordinary. And then every now and then you're traveling. Every now and then you're doing a get-together. Every now and then you have a moment that sticks out. But every day does not stick out. You could be uh, somewhat uh, idealistic about it and say, well, I try to make every day stick out. Sure. But there's certain things that are boring. And that's something that Everyone, no matter where they move, eventually has to understand. There's going to be certain things that are boring. 
Uh, you're going to have to wait in traffic. You're going to have to wait in the grocery lines. You're going to have to go to the grocery shop, uh, buy food, whatever. And if you're thinking that every single day is going to be an entertainment, buddy, you are mistaken. Just like relationships have a thing called the honeymoon phase, so does where you live. And wherever you live, there's the good stuff and then there's the bad stuff as well. The good stuff could be the weather, but the bad stuff could be something like uh, gang violence or it could be uh, not gang violence where, you know, what? if it's gang violence, that means there's certain little problems that's happening every day. Where you live, it could be a serial killer uh, being on the loose every 10 years. And you're thinking, man, I can never just chill because I'm always worrying about this damn serial killer. I mean, uh, the 10-year mark is coming up, you know. Um, so every place has a problem. Um, it's just up to the person to decide, where do you want to live? Where do you see yourself saying, this is a place where I could eventually see myself living like royalty? And you can't do that if you're just hopping around all the time. My philosophy is simple. I want to have a home base at a certain area. And other than that, I don't mind traveling. I don't mind exploring the world. But at the where I live, it needs to be stable. It needs to be a place where it's not too politically charged, where there's a crime, too much homeless folks. Like that. That's just the beginners. That's the starter pack on where Armani wants to live. And these homeless guys, um, they've been getting bold recently. I went to Wendy's uh, not too long ago, and I see a pattern. Whenever the homeless guys are getting hungrier, that's when they get more aggressive. Um, normally, uh, on this particular Wendy's, the homeless guys are standing off in the corner. And as you're walking in, every now and then, they'll ask, Hey, um, buddy, can you give me some change? Okay, you're in the corner. That's fine. But the later in the night uh, and the hungrier that they get, the closer and closer they get to the door. And one time I go to the Wendy's and I notice that they're standing literally right in front of the door. So I have to talk to them to just say, hey, uh, can I get through? And when I ask them, uh, can I get through? That's when they're like, uh, come on, come on, just give me some change. As if they're threatening me. As if like, yeah, you can get through. Uh, just give me some change first. I let them know. I'm like, I don't have any change. And uh, I have a debit card. And some of these homeless guys, they try to um, they try to negotiate with you. They're like, okay, well, um, you could just buy me something with your debit card then. I haven't eaten in a long time. It's like, I don't want to deal with this right now. First of all, I'm not going to buy you anything. Because anytime I buy a homeless guy something, what happens is right as I'm buying the homeless guy something, Another homeless guy comes in and he looks at me like I just broke his heart. He's like, you're buying this homeless guy something and you don't, you're not buying me anything. I'm looking at this guy like, I don't know you. I didn't even know you existed till two minutes ago. Um, and, and now they'll just say, come on, I haven't eaten in a long time. Can you please buy me something? And it's just a um, rabbit hole of, uh, of something that I don't want to do. Okay. I'm just trying to go. Uh, pick up the food and dip. And if the drive through line isn't that long, I will take the drive through line. See, this is something that people actually don't talk about too often. I, I notice whenever they're talking about uh, the, uh, the dollar losing purchasing power, they only talk about it in terms of the hard costs. They don't talk about it in terms of the soft costs. And l- let me break down the difference. The two ways that a lot of people know uh, and can tie their experiences to the economy is through food and through gas. If you talk to people in uh, th- that moved to the U.S., let's say in the 70s or 80s, they'll say, back in my time, uh, gas only cost 30 cents a gallon. So for these groups of people, they relate to the economy through gas. My generation, uh, we relate to the economy through food. We're like, back in my days, a McDouble would cost $1.07. Nowadays, it costs way more than that. And just by understanding, okay, uh, the gasoline used to be $0.30, cents, a McDouble used to be $1.07. It just makes you realize, whoa, 
the dollar is losing a lot of purchasing uh, power. That means I got to make more money. My dollar isn't worth what it used to be worth. That's economics 101. These are what I call the hard costs. This is something that can easily be quantified. But the soft costs in terms of your dollar losing purchasing power is due to two things. It's the outrageous tip culture and it's the homeless epidemic. Where nowadays, I mean, I, I talked about the homeless epidemic in the earlier part uh, of the episode, but in case this part gets clipped up, I was just saying nowadays you walk to a lot of places and there's folks that are just saying, give me some money. And let's say you're one of these guys that's saying, I am abundant. I am whole. I am uh, overflowing with the power to give. Like these are your mantras in the morning. And now a homeless guy is asking you for money. You're going to feel like a fraud if you're like, oh, I don't have any money to give. Even if you have a dollar and you're just like, I don't have any money to give, you're going to feel like a fraud. So you will pull out a dollar, maybe even $5, and you will give it to this guy. That is just an additional cost that you were not expecting in the beginning of the day. In addition to that, the tip culture. Nowadays, anywhere that you go, you got to like, just wonder, okay, is this place going to ask for tips? And it makes sense from the business side of things. It, it makes a lot of sense because you just need to uh, install a one-time menu uh, with 15%, 20%, 25% tip. And if you're slick, you add custom tip. You don't even put in the no tip button. And just like that, you have introduced a new stream of income. If you go to five spots in a day, you could easily spend 15 to $20 on tips. Every now and then, um, I'll have a Sunday where I do a bunch of different activities. And a couple of weeks back, there was a Sunday where I started off the day getting my car cleaned. And right after I get it cleaned, the guy's over here shuffling his body like, I really hope he gives me a tip. So I give him a tip. Then... I go to pick up some coffee. This person spins the tablet around. Tip? I'm like, okay, I'll give some tip. Later on, I went to Dave's Hot Chicken. Um, They're like, oh, uh, tip? I gave some more tip. Already, I spent $10. And it's like, man, I still have two more places to go. And here I am just spending so much money on tips. And it's like, the reason I call this the soft costs uh i like to call the soft economics um well, i gotta think of a better name i mean whatever the reason that it is soft versus the hard version of our, our dollar losing the purchasing power is because there's a choice i could always say no tip but now it's a little awkward because every now and then I notice when you click no tip, uh, it's one of those situations where the monitor is not registering. They'll say, well, you're clicking the button and it's like, it's just frozen on that. And now it'll say, would you like the uh, receipt printed? I'm like, no, 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 I don't want the receipt printed because then this person will see what my final cost was and he'll mathematically calculate that I didn't give him a tip. And I want to come to this place again. Nowadays, a lot of my decisions are made on, okay, I don't know where to go eat. Should I go to X, Y, and Z spot? Nah, because now I have to like, I have to think about the whole tip thing. Let me go to this place instead. And this place does not have the tip feature. And I think these places that don't have the tip feature, uh, it may actually seem like a bad thing. It's like, oh, well, see, these guys are losing out on a lot of potential money. But I think in the bigger picture, these folks are going to win because there's going to be a lot more Americans that are spending certain days where they're just going from activity to activity to activity. And it may just even be throughout the week, not just a particular day. And eventually it's going to click for them. They're going to say, look, I just have so much money uh, throughout uh, the day, you know, and if this certain spot is saying that I don't have to give a tip. I am spending what I am being advertised for. Then you know what? I'm just going to keep going back to this spot over and over again. And if more and more Americans do this, what's going to happen is that these places that just charge you what they said that they were going to charge you, they don't spring a tip uh, menu on you out of the blue moon. In the bigger picture, they're going to win. 
In the short term, it's going to feel like they're losing. But in the bigger picture, I'm pretty sure eventually people are just going to get fed up, especially with a lot of these viral clips nowadays. I mean, every other day, it seems as though I'm seeing a new clip on uh, YouTube of uh, a DoorDash guy that's mad that he didn't get uh, paid a certain amount. It's like, man, I want to hook you up. But us as people, we're limited, especially if you don't own a business. You have a salary. If you have a salary, then it's hard to just hook everyone up with tips. So this is how nowadays, if you're thinking about making more money, it's very practical. Uh, it's always been practical, by the way. But uh, for a lot of uh, years, someone's like, oh, man, like, you know, I'm not really a career sort of guy. I'm not really trying to move up. But nowadays, in a lot of different areas, if you're not making at least six figures, you shouldn't even think about starting a family because it's going to be very difficult for you. And this is one of those situations where uh, the idea of uh, uh, a, so a sole breadwinner is becoming tougher and tougher because the economics is becoming tougher and tougher to thrive in. Uh, this is actually like a financial reason to get married that I heard one of my married buddies talking about. It's like, dude, I feel bad for single people because uh, I can't even imagine like thriving nowadays as a single person. I need my wife's salary. I make a good amount of money too, but I need my wife's salary, especially since I have twins on the way. So this was one of the first times I was hearing one of the financial reasons to get married, uh, where a lot of people don't uh, make that argument ever, but this guy was. It's definitely a, a lot different, and I, I do think that um, more and more people are going to eventually work on building some sort of side hustle. They may have a job, uh, and I'm pretty sure most people will have a job, but every now and then I, I see more folks trying to do something on the side. And nowadays, um, there's more education in regards to stuff like this. I mean, there's obviously the Uber and the DoorDash route where you could make an extra couple of hundred bucks per week. And that sort of money can help you out, uh, especially if you don't mind driving. Uh, that could be an option. Another option uh, is um, doing the whole Shopify stores. Um, a lot of folks are creating uh, content regarding certain niches. Uh, Amazon KDP is always a great option to add in a couple of hundred dollars per month. But I do see more and more people adding some sort of side hustle in the future. And it would be cool if the side hustle is congruent with you. Uh, every now and then, I'll see someone doing something where they have no business doing it. Uh, I know a guy that is super, super, super um, uh, introverted. And he was thinking, okay, well, I'm thinking if I should start a YouTube channel. And I know this guy. Uh, I know this guy has to learn so much different things. He's not someone that's oozing out with words. He has to write scripts. He needs to um, memorize the scripts. He needs to now try to sprinkle in some personality in his talks. I'm just thinking, man, bro, you should find something better. Uh, something that is more congruent with you. You should actually blog. I noticed a lot of introverted folks blog nowadays. And that's something that's underrated. I mean, Google is the number one search engine. So if you know how to blog regarding a, a specific uh, theme and you know how to do uh, search engine optimization, then you will uh, be uh, thriving. Speaking of search engine optimization, uh, this is something that I bring up in my book, The Modern Day Polymath. And this is a guide on how you could learn uh, any topic out there in a very uh, scientific manner. Um, and one of the things that I bring up is finding the right information. Uh, because a lot of individuals think just because it's on the internet, it must be true. For these groups of people, I'd like to say that they are dumb with media literacy. But another group of people, they're a little bit more savvy. They realize just because it's on the internet does not mean that it's true. A lot of the stuff on the internet is garbage. And you need to scope through the material to see what's good, what's bad. But even these folks, they make this cardinal mistake, which is if they see something on page number one on Google, 
they automatically think that that's more uh, credible than something that's on page 10. And time and time again, after learning a multitude of different subjects, I've come to realize that this sentiment is incorrect. Just because it's on page one in Google does not mean that the content is better than something that is on page 10. And this is a earth shattering idea for many folks because even some of the most media savvy folks don't understand this. And one of the easiest ways for you to learn uh, about this idea that just because it's on page one doesn't mean it's more credible than something on page 10 is if you're very curious about yoga, uh, this is just the one sample topic that I often bring up to highlight this point. Try learning about yoga uh, and just look at a lot of the content on the first couple of pages. What you will consistently see is that these folks, they're not really trying to talk about yoga. They're trying to sell you on some sort of class. They're trying to get you to do something. And each article that you read, you're going to be like, man, I'm not really learning much from y'all. Don't quit though. Now just keep going to page two, page three, page four, eventually hit page 10. And this is when you will notice something. The sites are just getting uglier and uglier, but the content is getting better and better. This is when you will realize something. A lot of very smart individuals suck at SEO, search engine optimization. So their sites are ugly, they're clunky. A lot of folks are not even staying on the site too long because the color scheme is all messed up. This is registering poorly on Google. And this great content is being pushed back farther and farther on Google. It happens all the time. So if you want to be someone who actually learns, you need to be a little bit more patient, especially with Google, where a lot of these guys with sorry content, they will just sprinkle a particular keyword over and over again, just so they could rank on page one. And they'll hit up different sites and be like, hey, buddy, can you please link uh, to my blog? They're willing to put up with much more of the shenanigans or someone who really knows the field, then I'm going to try to link a build. Then I'm going to try to keyword stuff. They just want to get the content from point A to point B. That's it. But that's not always good because these folks, unfortunately, are not getting uh, eyeballs on their content because they're not taking search engine optimization seriously at all. I would say just knowing some basic SEO is so underrated because it's such a passive way for you to get traffic. That's how I like to think. I'm not really creating content for today. I'm creating content for the bigger picture. My mindset is build a library. And more and more folks that are executives, CEOs, and the head honchos, they think in terms of libraries versus day-by-day -day hits. Because if you get day-by-day -day hits, it can just come and then uh, who is to say if someone is going to consume the content 10 years from now? That's not always guaranteed. But if you have a library, now chances of having success is astronomically higher. To this day, people are watching uh, Toy Story. Toy Story is one of those rare moments where you got a hit and it's in a library, aka Pixar. And this is one of the cool things with uh, brand building. There's just so many different ways to build a brand. Uh, some folks like to, you know, talk about uh, trending topics, while other folks like to talk more about evergreen topics. I think if you could do a little bit of both, then you have a great library that has a lot of value. There's this very interesting book called The Long Tell, and it's written by Chris Anderson. And within the book, he talks about how uh, due to how cheap it is to create content online, nowadays, you could pretty much create content about anything, even the niches. And what Chris would do was he would go to different um, big companies and he would see, do the niches, aka the tail portion uh, of a distribution curve, do they really make money? Why don't you just get rid of it and only invest in the hits? And what Chris Anderson found is that if you uh, tally up the entire tell, it makes more money than the hits. I thought, 
wait a minute, that's a very uh, strange insight. I would have never thought that. I thought the hits would make more money, but that's not always accurate. If you go to any music uh, music streaming service, you would think that Taylor Swift brings uh, in most of the revenue, but that's not always the case. If you get all the little niches of music that's out there, uh, let's say Pickleback made a song. I don't even know if there is a Pickleback, but let's say there is a band called Pickleback and they have a hardcore fan base. Now you just keep finding different bands like Pickleback and you tally them all up and you compare them with the J. Coles, the Taylor Swifts, uh, the uh, Britney Spears out there and you see who brings in more money, you'll be shocked to see that the Picklebacks bring in more money than these hit makers. And that's how um, Chris Anderson was breaking down the long tail. He's like, more and more companies and media empires should be focusing on the niches, the niches that are going underserved. It's like if you stack up a bunch of the niche topics, it will eventually um, compete with a lot of the hit makers. I actually see this with the Armani Talks brand. I think one unique thing with uh, creating a lot of these talks is that I can virtually create talks about anything, uh, but I don't. I mainly stick with communication skills. And within communication skills, there's the hits out there, right? Like how to deliver a speech. That's a very popular topic that uh, a lot of different folks are searching for. But then there are the niche topics as well. The niche topics such as, um, why does my neck hurt when I talk for more than 30 minutes? I mean, that's a very specific um, thing to even ask. A lot of people don't even have the uh, ability to articulate one of those inquiries out loud. They just feel the pain and they just go about their day. But every now and then someone is capable of articulating it. And a lot of them, they go on Google and YouTube and they search it. And the thing is, a lot of creators they're not going to make a video on that because it's so niched. But my philosophy is I'm going to make a video on that. Okay? So if someone is searching for it around the planet, they discover an Armani Talks video. And the thing you could say is, but bro, and I mean, how many people are really going to search for a topic like that from around the world? Maybe 30? A, 30 people over time can add up. So I will cover those topics. I mean, every now and then there's like a book that people will say that made a big dent in them. And I would say the long tail uh, book did make a re really big dent on me because it allowed me to view content in a very different sort of way. Because I wouldn't ever want someone having a camera and following me uh, in terms of what I watch. Because uh, I watch a lot of strange stuff. I watch documentaries, I watch cooking videos, prank videos, very niche topics. I mean, not too long ago, I was watching um, this documentary on a group of people in Pakistan that live right next to the mountains. And it's like, I'm like, I don't know why I'm intrigued by this, but I am. And it's like, uh, it's like, the folks that live right by the mountain, they get a lot of their resources on the other side of the mountain. And to drive a car on that mountain is very risky. One wrong turn and you could die. So some folks in the uh, in this little civilization, their entire career is them walking up the mountain and sweeping the gravel off uh, the road. So the one guy who actually has the specified skills to drive the car up the mountain doesn't die. And this guy who could drive the car up this mountain to get the resources, he is seen as the king within his community. And I'm over here consuming this content and I'm thinking, how intriguing is this? Because at what, like as an American, as anyone that's living in the West um, or anywhere that's highly civilized, you would never think that this is a job that's going to win you clout, a driver. But in this place, due to the geographic setup of how things work, this is a coveted job. He gets respect because he has the balls to drive this dangerous mountain. 
and I'm consuming this and I'm like, I'm really glad whoever made this made this because it just made me realize uh, how grateful I am to be living where I am, where I could just drive from point A to point B without any issues. I don't have to cl- drive up something, right? Uh, but more importantly, these folks who created the content on the mountain man, they uh, understood some parts of the long tail. And that is that with the long tail, if you create the content, a lot of the times your content will be super niched, but it will appeal to someone. And if you have enough of those content pieces within your library, I would say that your library is very, very powerful. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, had a very famous saying. He's like, attract the shrimp and the sharks will come. And I thought, man, that is a very uh, unique perspective because you will never hear about this. You will never hear about um, how you should focus on the tiny content pieces because too many folks are chasing the hits. They're trying to go viral, which by the way, I completely understand. If one of these tiny videos that I do ends up going viral, I'm not going to be complaining about it because I've seen videos that go viral. They make a lot of money. They can bring in a bunch of subscribers and that's good for your brand. And that's the typical advice. Like, hey, uh, see what everyone else is doing and create uh, content based on that. Now you increase the likelihood of you going viral. But with the long tail, it just makes you think about content differently. Just saying, no, um, you, th- th- that's a strategy for sure. But I have more niche topics to tackle. I know other people from around the planet are searching it. And even if it's 30 folks, I'm going to keep targeting these niched topics. I'm not going to forget about the mainstream topics, but I'm still going to have my brand uh, cover these niche topics. And if you grow it and you increase your viewpoint, you'll notice, oh, whoa, whoa, these tiny little videos are now uh, bringing in a lot of folks. And I think that's how you build the foundations online. Building the foundations, uh, I, I could tell how serious someone is based on the versatility of what they've spoken about. If they literally just do the latest trends, I don't know, man. Something about that, it doesn't feel good for the soul. Uh, it just feels as though, man, these guys are a mouthpiece. They will do whatever the hell is going viral right now. And these are very easy folks to brainwash. And unfortunately, a lot of these guys go crazy the fastest. But the other guys that are like, you know what, let me take some time. Let me just build the foundations. It will allow me to uh, really know my craft, really understand the 360 aspect of the, the, the field that I cover with my brand. And I'll just be a subject matter expert. Nowadays, I mean, I would say Since starting Armani Talks, um, I don't only create content. I I also have a consulting side to things. I would say the consulting side to things has been one of the most unique experiences because you get to see a lot of issues that you thought no one goes through. That's number one. But then you see someone go through it, and then you see someone else go through it, and someone else go through it. They don't know each other, and you're like, Wait a minute, man. This is actually, uh, this is actually something I could create content on. So if you have a consulting practice, I believe you of all people should create content because you're always going to get ideas. I mean, one of the examples I can give you is, um, I recall one day someone wrote on one of my YouTube videos, this guy does not blink at all. And I thought, what? Fam, this is a nine minute video. Uh, you didn't see me blink a single time. So I watched this video back and I noticed something. I didn't blink a single time. I was just like this the entire time. Oh, I just blinked right now. But here's the thing. I never entered that video saying I'm not going to blink a single time. What happens is that when you look at a certain portion of the camera, you don't have to blink. And added to this, if you're, let's say, doing impromptu speaking and you're having to think a lot, 
you're just going to be really zoned in and you're going to just be looking at the camera, not blinking. You will notice that a lot of novice individuals who are speaking in front of the camera for one of the first times will have this issue happen to them. And other than the not blinking part, everything else could be flawless. You may be telling some amazing jokes, using your palms, um, moving your face around. But still, when you don't blink at all, that's a little weird. You'll watch back the video, and unless someone tells you that you didn't blink at all, and you don't even know, you're just going to be like, something about this video feels off. The opposite is also true, where you blink a little too much. But still, uh, the, the main idea is that blinking can cause an issue with recording in front of the camera. I thought I was the only one who went through something like this. And one day, I recall I was uh, working with this guy. Let's call him Arun. And uh, I had him recording videos of us so he could get in the habit of articulating his ideas out loud. And one day he sends me one of the videos and now I wanted to make him aware. I was like, great video, Arun. I like this, this, and this. Uh, but next time, uh, just try to blink. You didn't blink once in a six-minute video. And he had the same reaction that I did before. He's like, what? It was six minutes, man. Like, you're telling me I didn't blink at all? impossible i was like watch the video back he watched the video back and he's like i didn't blink at all and that's when i saw something this is an issue this is something that um other folks that have never experienced it will not be able to tell from the get-go and that's when i know okay you put in your reps because you're capable of even noticing something like this i think people undermine how people that notice things they keep things moving forward. That's how science begins. You just notice something or you notice the lack of something. You're like, why does it do this instead of this? And that's how a lot of scientific breakthroughs happen. So then I, eventually I saw another guy with the same blinking problem. And at this point, I knew it. I was just like, look, it's happening due to different reasons. It's because you're a beginner. You're looking at a certain part of the camera. What I would recommend you do is try to talk to the camera a little bit more like a friend rather than an object. And this often resolves the issue because a lot of the times when we're speaking in front of the camera, the last thing we're doing is we're treating it like a friend. One of my podcast coaches said, uh, you should actually get a picture and you should put it on the microphone, a very small picture, uh, because I didn't have to do a camera with uh, him. It was more so a microphone thing. And I remember when I was speaking in front of the microphone, I was speaking like this. It's because I just didn't know how to speak into a microphone. It seems easy until you do it. And you're like, man, I sound really stiff. And he's just like, I get this picture and put it in front of the microphone. I, th that would actually distract me. So um, with all due respect, Eric, it didn't work for me. Instead, what I did was I would smile. I would smile, hold it for a couple of seconds. like, And then I would speak in front of um, uh, the microphone, the camera, whatever. And I felt looser. And that's when the blinking would happen. And every now and then, here's what you'll notice. All that stuff, it distracts you so much that you just have to remind yourself, hey, but at least I'm aware that I don't blink too much. Let me blink real quick. And now let me go on with the talk. And this is why a lot of these talks are very awkward for a certain period until you begin uh, figuring it out. I mean, a lot of the content that we consume um Let's say for mainstream organizations, let's say ESPN. Nowadays, a lot of these guys seem so smooth in terms of delivering their words. But if you look back at their catalog, you will notice that a lot of these guys in the beginning stages, they were not that charismatic. I mean, you look at a lot of the content of ESPN from late 80s, early 90s, like, man, these guys dress like weirdos. These guys talk weird. There's no fire in their personality. But nowadays, they're starting to figure it out. And a lot of them will say that. They'll be like, man, I'm just figuring it out. So speaking in front of the camera, creating any form of content out there, it's one of those things where it is not easy. 
I give props to anyone that uh, puts in the effort, uh, is consistently generating new talks. Um, because it, it, it's one thing for someone else to give you a topic and say, hey, can you talk about that? Which, by the way, still respectable. But it's another thing when you assign yourself the topic and then you speak on that. It's like you really do have control of all aspects of your brand. And that's something I think very few folks can do. But if you can do it, it's a skill. It's one of those skills that will never cause you to run out of things to say. You will always have unique things to say. And I think if you already uh, see a lot of the opportunities that you have to consistently think of different things to say, then it will help you out. And with that being said, I want to give one final talk to improve um, observation skills because all great storytellers have great observation skills. And a lot of folks, they just hope that they stumble onto great observation skills where you can stumble into it, but it's much better if you understand what to look out for. And one of the best things to look out for is annoyance. What annoys you? If you could simply answer that, it just gets you in the habit of noticing things. You know what annoys me? Loud cars. Because here's the thing. Every now and then I'm driving and there's like one of these cars that will come out of the blue moon that are so freaking loud. It's like, like this loud engine. It's so loud where if you're having a conversation with someone, you need to stop having the conversation until this car leaves. If you're trying to listen to music, you have to, um, you have to like turn up the volume more until this car leaves. But here's the issue. A lot of the times, these cars don't leave. You would expect that since the engine is so loud that it's going to drive fast, right? But they don't drive fast. They drive slow. And my thing is, wait a minute. Why the hell are you getting uh, this loud engine in the first place? Just so you could feel your ass vibrate while you're driving? Come on, drive. And since they're not driving, it just bugs me. And I'm just thinking, man, you are just a public nuisance at this point. And notice something. I'm just over here noticing different things about this car. I'm not necessarily trying to create this talk for any particular reason. Just get in the habit of noticing without any end game. I, I can notice more things about this car. I'm like, man, these cars... And their windows are always tinted because I want to get mad at someone, but I can't get mad at these guys because I don't even know what the hell they look like. And that's when I realized something. A lot of the times on TikTok, I'll see these videos of cars getting pulled over because their tint is too dark. So that's the thing. You could get fined because your tint is too dark, but can you get fined because your engine is too loud? They should make a fine like that. If I ever become a politician, I am going to ban loud cars. And here's the thing. The only way that you will not get um, fined or banned, whatever, for these loud ass cars is if you drive fast. If you have a clear lane in front of you and you're driving slow, you of all people, you may even go to prison if I'm a politician. So I'm just over here having fun. But overall, I'm just noticing a bunch of things about loud, loud cars. I notice that they often don't drive fast and it just seems like they're trying to be annoying. And now I'm starting to think, what is emotionally wrong with you for you to have this loud of a car? Why do you want to have all these eyeballs looking at you uh, in the streets? Uh, and it's like, it, it's, I feel like something is emotionally wrong with these folks and I'm just capable of noticing different things. It, it's just taking me different spots and it all began with what annoys me so a lot of folks whenever they get annoyed they try to just brush it under the rug they're like oh no 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 uh, i need to be a patient good boy while if you're trying to improve your storytelling skills anytime something annoys you you should acknowledge it like this is really annoying me this is annoying me too this is annoying me too and just observe the annoyance without any form of expectations and you will notice your mind just 
hooking from one annoyance to another, to another, to another. Your observation skills are sharpening. And from there, a talk will often emerge. Uh, this is how a lot of comedy happens. Uh, the comedian is just noticing a bunch of things and then a, a great theme and a lesson emerges. So that is a very underrated way to improve your observation skills. Follow the pain, follow the annoyance. Anyways, we have hit the one hour mark. Hopefully you enjoyed this talk. If you're listening from YouTube, be sure to drop that like for me right on below. Hit that subscribe uh, as well. Hit that bell notification to stay updated with the latest videos on the Armani Talks channel. And if you are listening from a major podcast provider, uh, be sure to leave your boy a review. And thank you very much for joining me. Have fun in September.